blog post 13, the dark side of bodybuilding, anabolic steroids. Hi, I'm Paul Baxendale, and welcome to blog post number 13, unlucky for some, and perhaps for me this week, as today I'm going to be talking about the dark side of our sport, anabolic steroids and other performance enhancing drugs. But first, a few wise words from a great Stoic philosopher, as we well may need them when talking about this topic, or any other topic where there is the potential for harm, whether that is in what you put into your body, but also what you put into your mind. There is no vice which lacks a defence, none that at the outset isn't modest and easily intervened. But after this, the trouble spreads widely. If you allow it to get started, you won't be able to control when it stops. Now, before I begin this week, I need to make a, a type of disclaimer of sorts. Now, I'm not a doctor, nor am I giving advice, nor advising anyone to use these types of drugs. Any information I'm giving is educational, and also for educational purposes, but with the intent that the information will assist the listener in learning about this class of drug. With that being said, let's talk about my career, anabolic steroids, and the role it played in my bodybuilding career. I will be, as I always am, completely frank and honest with you. The dosages I talk about are actual, they're real. They're not hyped up, nor are they lowered down. They are what they were. The subject is too large to fit into one episode, really. So rather than do one huge three or four hour vlog, I thought it best to produce three shorter vlogs so that you can watch each of them at your leisure. Or if you are a glutton for punishment, you can simply continue to watch parts two and three immediately after the first one. Okay, now where do we begin? Well, at the start, of course. It may be helpful if we approach this topic by me firstly explaining how I came to my own decision, how to use or when to use anabolic steroids and other performance enhancing drugs. Then I'll explain what I believe were the errors I made and also how I would use them again if I was 24 again. And yes, I was 24 when I began my very first cycle. That was after 10 years of training in gyms and after several competitions where I either won or came second. I was fortunate and I guess good enough to not come less than second in any of my first six shows. In fact, it wasn't until my very first British final that I experienced placing out of the top six for the very first time. But after that, it certainly wasn't the last time. So firstly, that's a good point to begin with. At what age and at what time should you start taking anabolic steroids if you decide that you are going to use them? Well, firstly, I would say categorically that if you are not competing, then there is absolutely no need at all to take anabolic steroids. If you want to look great for the beach or for the club or just for yourself, then you have no need whatsoever for steroids. Unless that is you're maybe over 45 or 50 and you're considering using testosterone as a means of hormone replacement therapy. In which case, then you're not looking to enhance your performance. You're merely looking to keep your body feeling l like it was a little, <clears throat> a little younger than you were 10, 15 years ago. Or maybe you're experiencing low moods due to low testosterone levels, in which case your doctor should help you prescribe you maybe with testosterone patches or via an injection maybe weekly or, or bi-weekly. But TRT isn't in the remit 
of this series so I won't be talking about that right so when is a good age to start well that's a very difficult question as it really depends upon your time in the gym and the level of competition you're entering I'll put it this way if you've been training for less than three years or you're under 20 then forget it there's no way on earth you should be even considering using anabolics what I hope you're doing instead is setting yourself up for a lifetime of training to keep yourself fit healthy strong and with a well-developed physique and that then may you wish to compete in bodybuilding and at a decent level and to compete at that level you're going to you're going to have to consider using anabolics to stand on stage in equal comparison with your competitors now remember when i said i won or came second in my first six shows well that taught me something it taught me that i was likely that i had decent genetics for bodybuilding for for, for the first place and that was a, an important part of my decision making process when i started competing of course i knew about steroids but i didn't even think about using them because i didn't know anybody who had them and secondly i really didn't think i needed them by the look of my fellow competitors what if I turned up and I'd looked an idiot when everyone around me could have been huge and ripped? Well, there's always a chance of that, but very, very unlikely. If you choose to do a first time as show or first time as class, which means that everyone there has never done a show before. I also got feedback from people in the gym who had competed. And although I never asked them straight, should I take steroids? I did ask them if they thought I was looking okay for a first time as show. And I asked them how I was looking as I dieted down. I know things are very different today, but society is also, and there's a big problem in society with instantaneous gratification and wanting everything now. Well, life is going to be tough if you have that attitude. So my advice is work for what you want. Don't take the easy road and the same goes for steroids. Don't take them until you really feel you need to, to compete evenly with others because you are entering into a deal with the devil and I'll tell you why. If you don't wait until you have fully utilized your own natural genetic potential then firstly, you won't ever get the most from the use of anabolics, since you could have got further without them. And secondly, when you stop using them, then if you have a lot of mature, seasoned, natural muscle, then it's much more likely to stay with you for your lifetime, rather than someone who takes anabolics as soon as they begin training, and all of their muscle is gained by the use of performance enhancing drugs and not naturally in other words it will fall off them much more quickly and likely within a few months of not training they'll look like they've never trained at all now look at me today okay i'm 56 yes i'm disabled in a wheelchair at times to go down the street so i'm unable to squat or do much for my legs anymore I do a few leg extensions and minimal leg press movement, that's all I can do. And yet, I'm able to hold pretty much the same amount of muscle I have for the last 10 years, ever since my accident. And that's due, I believe, to the 10 years of natural training that I did when I was younger. And then these days, using testosterone replacement therapy, which I do use, which involves 250 milligrams of testosterone enanthate every 10 days. Now, why do I need to use any testosterone at all? You might rightly ask. And the answer, the answer is that as I approached my late 40s, there was a distinct lowering 
of my mood. Bear in mind that I had also gone through the trauma of a life-changing accident, finding myself disabled and added to the low mood. I also found my libido, which had always returned to its good natural levels, some four weeks after I'd ever finished a course in the past, it was now also poor. The onset of becoming a type 1 diabetic due to the accident may well have also impacted on my libido. So after much reflection, I decided that I would use TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, as most other retired bodybuilders do use. I was never one to just go along with what whatever anyone else was doing, as by now the scene had changed so much. The levels even for TRT was often crazy. You could really call them mini cycles rather than the therapeutic levels which they should be set at. So with my discussions with friends my age also on TRT and the conversation with my GP, I decided to run with a level of 250 milligrams every 10 days, which was in the mid range of dosages prescribed by doctors. Some who prescribed a 200 milligram shot each week, others a 250 milligram shot every two weeks, and the highest prescribed dose I came across was a daily testosterone gel to be rubbed on daily of testosterone undecanoate, which would equate to 350 milligrams each week. It was 50 milligrams a day. Now, that's if all the active testosterone was available after it had gone through the skin, which it may not have been. So please bear in mind that once you start taking steroids or testosterone, it's very likely that you'll continue using them and to think you'll stop when you feel like it or when you retire is simply naive and honestly just lying to yourself. Now, have I ever stopped completely? Yes, I have. For 12 years after I first retired. Now, once I retired, I just decided to stop, go cold turkey, no PCT, no post cycle therapy. I stopped everything. Now, I'm talking about these drugs as though they're addictive. Now, while they're not physically addictive, they certainly are mentally addictive to the point where some people don't even bother to train when they're off cycle. Now, when I came off that 12 year period, it took me about four to six weeks for my own natural testosterone levels to kick back in. So I knew my endocrine system was somewhat returning to normal. However, I then noticed the gradual loss of strength and size and also condition which wasn't helped by the fact that I had emigrated to another country and I hadn't got myself into a decent routine yet with either training nor nutrition. So in all, I would say after 12 months, after a year, I started to feel really good again. My diet was in order. I was training six days a week. I was actually training in the Australian pro bodybuilder Terry Mitsos's gym in Sydenham in Sydney, Australia. I look back at that time and although I had lost a lot of body weight, my body shape wasn't actually that much different. I had become lean again since I was doing an hour's power walking on the beach every morning before I hit the gym and I was eating cleanly every day too. So for 10 of those 12 years I was definitely back to feeling great, feeling a lot healthier and I had no temptation at all to go back using anabolics. Now partly it was because they were so difficult and so expensive to get hold of but secondly and more importantly I had a new persona, I had a brand new business, I had a new life and I had absolutely no feeling or desire to be any bigger than I currently was back then. As it was, other people thought I was big anyway, which must tell you something about how some bodybuilders using anabolics who still feel small must suffer from some body dysmorphia. Anyway, back to anabolics and their use today. I would say that most bodybuilders today never 
come completely off cycle. From what I hear and what they tell me, they're running something continually. What they call bridging or cruising or TRT because of their addiction. So you don't want to get into that mess. So let's see how you can use them with the minimal amount of harm potential. Because you are, you have to be aware that any drug, whether it's paracetamol or testosterone propionate, has the potential for side effects. Yes, bad side effects are rare with anabolics, but you have to be careful to minimize even the rare ones. So, after a good few years of training under your belt, you are competing and now you've made the decision that you want to utilize the benefits of using a performance enhancing drug. Well, where do you start? I started with 200 dianabol tablets over a six week period. Yes, I know it's laughable by today's standards, but with those 200 dianabol tablets, I gained over 20 pounds. Mostly was muscle and water, good body weight. And that was due to my body being primed over the last 10 years of training. So that when it received some pharmaceutical support to recover better, it did so. And hence the large muscle growth. Now would everyone in my position gain the same amount of muscle? No chance. As with training naturally, your genetics for building muscle are already predetermined. And if you're a hard gainer, then it's doubtful that anabolics will do for you what they will do for an easy gainer. Now, why do you think it is that the superstars of bodybuilding, when they are, when they are open about their steroid usage, always state very mild quantities, much lower than most people today, or even lower than other competitors of their time? because they are genetically gifted for building muscle. You either are or you aren't. Sorry, but that's the harsh truth about professional bodybuilding. And it's important that you learn that early. It's the one thing bodybuilding, it's one thing bodybuilding for life, to be in great shape and enjoy the process of being in shape. And it's a whole other ball game if you want to be a professional competitive bodybuilder. Because for the first, everyone can do it. For the second, no matter how hard you try, no matter what drugs you take or how much you eat and sleep, you will never make money as a competitive bodybuilder unless you are genetically gifted for this sport. Anyway, so after 200 Dianabol, what did I do? Well, firstly, I had to explain to everybody how I was able to literally transform my body over a six week period when I'd been training for 10 years and then suddenly experienced this insane growth. Of course, people aren't stupid. Everybody knew what I'd done, just not exactly what I'd done. So I explained to them that I was no longer a natural competitor, but had decided to really give bodybuilding a go and had gone on the juice but personally i did nothing afterwards i kept training hard my strength levels had increased a fair bit and i kept eating my normal high calorie diet it was high carbohydrate medium protein and low fats back then and i tried to grow some more while i took a good few months off to allow my body to adapt to this new muscle tissue and to ensure that my own endocrine system got back to normal, if it had been affected at all. I wasn't sure. All I knew was that when you came, if you came off for as long or longer than you were on, it was the best thing to do. Then I had the British finals approaching. So I knew that when I began my prep, then I would have to begin another cycle and I would run it through to the finals. But what was I going to do this time? Now by now I had been accepted into the big boys club of bodybuilding and had I had someone who I could get advice from. 
Now there were two other guys in my gym competing at the time and both of them were using anabolics and both of them were denying using anabolics. It was pretty ridiculous. I mean, they both knew that I knew they were on and yet they would still play this game pretending as though they were clean for the other gym members as they didn't want people knowing. Well, that option wasn't available to me simply because that six week transformation period was so drastic and dramatic that even if I tried to stay, I was still natural. I would have been laughed at. I would never lie to anybody either about my use. It's ridiculous, why would you? So I was always upfront about it. It certainly saved any embarrassment of somebody finding out and thinking you were an idiot for lying about it in the first place. Now I went to Newbury to see my best friend, my dear friend, Graham Black. Graham was a top competitor with NABBA back then, so he really knew his stuff. And we were really good friends. So, and he knew that I'd done a cycle of Dianabol, and he was happy to help me with advice when it came to working out my next cycle and how to run it into the British finals. I knew it was going to have to involve needles as Dianabol were just tablets. But I did also know that orals were more liver toxic than injectables. So I was going to have to go down that route eventually. And here we were, needles. Now that was a scary prospect. I was going to have to learn how to inject myself with a needle. And it wasn't one of those small insulin type needles that I'd seen before. These were big, long, green topped needles that I wasn't sure where to put for a start for fear of hitting a bone or a nerve. As it turns out, it's quite a simple procedure, but you do need to be careful with all injections as there's always a risk of hitting a blood vessel or getting an infection from unsterile technique or from the product itself. Although back then, all our anabolics came from pharmacies, so we didn't have to worry about getting an infection from an unsterile product back then. Back then, there were no garage labs making underground steroids like there are today. Okay, so let's take a moment to reflect on where we've got to, and I'll continue with the story and advice. Thinking about our bodies as a fortress a Stoic once said, on decisions and your own tyrants, how is the fortress destroyed? Not by iron or fire, but from judgments. Here is where we must begin. And it is from this front that we must seize the fortress and throw out the tyrants. Always remain your own ruler and never allow your own tyrant to take over your mind or your body. So Graham and I talked and I said that I realized that I was going to have to use injectables. So what would be a good protocol be for the period leading into the show? Now, I don't remember exactly what was agreed way back then, but I do know it was starting off using a form of long-acting testosterone, probably Sustanon, as these were easily got back then from the makers Organon, directly from Karachi in Pakistan, and Deca Drabalon, which we got from an English pharmacy. It was two shots of Sustanon each week with two shots of Deca, which made it nice and easy since you could fit both ampules into one syringe and inject it meaning just two injections per week rather than having to do four separate ones. This first stage would last about four weeks and then I was to switch over to testosterone propionate for three 100 milligram shots per week and three shots of Prima Bolan each week which were ampules of 100 milligram too. So the last four weeks, 
men injecting three times a week. In the way of totals, this gave me 500 milligrams of long-acting testosterone per week for the first four weeks, and with it, 400 milligrams of DECA a week. And then for the last four weeks, the testosterone dropped to 300 milligrams per week, but of a fast-acting type, and 300 milligrams of Prima Bolan Depot a week, methanolone acetate, a much more anabolic, less androgenic drug. The way we worked it was to go for long-acting ethers in the first stage, which naturally led to slightly higher water retention, but a bigger testosterone increase. And then switched to fast-acting, which meant that the androgenic testosterone had less time to aromatize and convert to estrogen and therefore wouldn't hold as much water. Together with the higher anabolic, which didn't hold hardly any water anyway. So I should be nice and dry for the show. Just needing a slight cutback of water in the last 12 hours or so to get me dry enough for stage. Nothing else was discussed. There was no mention of growth hormone, of clenbuterol, of stimulants, of diuretics. It was my first prep cycle and it was kept as it should have been nice and simple. The anabolics were just the tiny icing on the cake as the main part of the focus was always, always completely on training, dieting and cardio. Oh, and as much sleep as I could get whilst doing those other things. My first contest prep with anabolics was completely different to those I'd experienced before, naturally. In that for the first few weeks of dieting, my actual body weight increased, which concerned me, but it didn't concern Graham as he looked at me as he assured me I was getting leaner by the week and I was on track for my normal standard of condition, which by now had been set at a high standard. And so if I was seen in anything less than stellar condition by the judges, if they knew me, and by now most of the judges did know my physique, then I would have been penalized regardless of how anybody else was looking. Plus, I loved getting shredded to the bone. So I wasn't gonna start losing that feeling. At the end of the prep, I was only about eight pounds down from where I started the prep, and yet I was in the best condition yet. So I must have experienced some very good muscle tissue gains. Again, even though my calories were in a slight deficit, this is where anabolics give the competitor the most advantage. When you're dieting, they act as they should anabolically and they stop the loss of muscle tissue, even despite your calorie deficit. So they act both anti-catabolically and anabolically at the same time. Anti-catabolic meaning stopping the breakdown of muscle tissue and anabolic meaning the building up of muscle tissue. Now I got top 10 in my first British finals. I was very happy and I was also very happy with how I looked on stage and it was very different to my old natural on stage physique. The extra muscle tissue was very obvious to me. And I also found the prep much more enjoyable with my mood being much better all the way through and my energy and my aggression in the gym being really good too. I hadn't experienced any side effects so far. So I was happy with continuing with using anabolics in the off season and further prep seasons from this point on. There was one thing that was troubling me though, and that was the talk of bitch tits by the guys and how some people on steroids were susceptible to getting lumps of fatty tissue underneath their nipples, hence the phrase bitch tits. Now, the reason I was particularly concerned was that when I was a teenager, when I was 17 years old, I did develop a lump under my left nipple. And I went to the doctor who explained, 
No, it was nothing to worry about. It was perfectly normal as a result of puberty and my body producing higher amounts of testosterone. And that it should go away on its own, but that if it didn't, he would prescribe me something. Now I know he probably would have prescribed me something like Norvidex to remove it. Now, luckily, the lump went of its own accord and I didn't need to see the doctor again. But it did make me think I might be susceptible to get another lump if I started taking exogenous testosterone, as my body obviously produced a lot of it normally. And I was also susceptible, I thought, to getting bitch tits. But as it turned out, surprisingly for me, and for everyone else who I knew, who knew I had it as a teenager, I never ever developed bitch tits as a competitive bodybuilder, never in my career. And I rarely ever even used an anti-estrogen, which was used then to prevent getting bitch tits when running courses. Now, after a few courses, I realized that if I was going to get a lump under my nipples, I would have done so by then. I was very lucky. I've never had another lump since that teenage incident. I don't know why or how, but it just was something I never suffered from. In fact, back then, back in the 90s, I don't remember that many guys getting them back then. Perhaps it's a question of the dosages of testosterone that makes the difference. Anyway, so that was the show over. I got straight back into the gym. I stopped using all anabolics. I'd only bought enough for the prep cycle anyway, and knew I would be taking a good three month break before doing anything else. As it turned out after 10 weeks, I was eager to get growing again and get back on. And I wanted to try another cycle. So I started to study up about the various ethers of testosterone and the different anabolic products which were available to me in the UK. And I decided I would try a different type of long acting testosterone or together with an anabolic agent and also run another cycle of dianabol alongside it for added anabolic effect. But that cycle was gonna to have to wait for a few weeks because I just won an all expenses paid trip to the Cannes Film Festival for two. So together with my girlfriend at the time, I got ready for the holiday of a lifetime, up to that point at least. And as it turned out, it would also help my bodybuilding career in a big way too, especially with regards to these new special supplements I was now taking. As I had just competed, I was still in great shape. So I took along my brand new Perfetto Unitard and Lycra shorts and my Gold's Gym vest, as well as my tuxedo for the evening premieres. And off we set. Now, if you've never been to the Cannes Film Festival, all I can say is it's like existing in another world, the world of the rich and the famous. During the day, men and women would be walking along the pedestrian walkways in full evening attire, ball gowns for the women and tuxedos for the men. It was a little surreal, but it was a lot of fun too. Now I was there to have a good time, so I wasn't too bothered about training, but I did go to a couple of gyms. One of them was the one which Momo Benaziza called home. His photos were all over the walls, and it was obviously he was very well loved here. And I was very keen to meet him, obviously, but sadly our timing wasn't good as he was away in another part of Europe at the time. So I left a note for him, wishing him the best, and I had a good talk with the gym owner. And I asked the gym owner what the situation was like in France with buying anabolics from the pharmacies. And he said, it was no problem. Whatever you want, you can get either that day or the pharmacist orders it in and you pick it up the next day. You can get anything from the usual products, but also growth hormone, 
injectable vitamins, minerals, and a list of anabolics I've never heard of, including a class of drugs I'd never heard of before either, thyroid medications for assisting dieting. It appeared I was in for an education in pharmacology too while I was there. Now we went to most of the premieres during that week. Dolph Lundgren was there along with Jean-Claude Van Damme, who was just making a big name for himself. And I remember we watched one evening as Jean-Claude and Dolph had a scuffle on the way into the premiere. Of course, it was all scripted and staged, but it was a lot of fun to the crowd. And the audience thought it was all real, so it was really good. Dolph pushed Jean-Claude, who then squared up to Dolph Drago, threw a quick jab, missing obviously, and then Jean-Claude sent a roundhouse kick flying around the side of Lundgren's head. It was obviously all for the promotional film, but it was really good fun, and we had a, a great time watching it all. During the mornings, I would often take a walk along the beach, and I use it as an excuse to wear my new unitard that I had seen Francis Benfato wear in a flex magazine. <laughs> and to my surprise, on turning around one morning, as I was walking on the beach, I noticed a couple of hundred people following me. Now, they had no idea who I was, but they must have thought I was somebody <laughs> because of my look. The next thing, people were approaching me, taking photographs of me, asking me for autographs. They had no idea who I was. Was I a professional athlete, they asked. Was I a stuntman? Was I an actor? Now, the sad thing for me was that nobody asked, was I a professional bodybuilder? <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't big enough yet to be considered as a pro bodybuilder, even by people who didn't know me. That was hilarious looking back, and one of the times when I wished I had a mobile phone back then, as I would love to have taken photos of the whole thing. I don't think I've got one photograph of the entire week. Anyway, at least I was being noticed for looking different. An athletic, even if it wasn't bodybuilder different. Obviously. As I had just done my first show with anabolics, I was shredded, but still small shredded. And although I looked very different from your average man or actor, everyone just assumed I was a professional athlete or stuntman. Oh, well, I thought, I'll take that for now. That same afternoon, we walked into the center of Cannes to the largest pharmacy I could find and walked in. Now it was quiet, so I pulled out my list from my pocket of all the names of the drugs that I knew. The list wasn't that long. <laughs> but as I asked the pharmacist if he could provide me with these products, he smiled and he walked me over to a counter full of boxes of all sorts of various drugs, obviously performance enhancing drugs, from anabolics to testosterones to thyroid drugs to diuretics, injectable vitamins, injectable amino acids, they had everything. I have to admit, I was like a little kid at Christmas. I couldn't believe my luck. Not only were there everything under the sun that an athlete and a bodybuilder could use, he was able to tell me about many different drugs that he sold to bodybuilders in France and abroad. Abroad? I asked him how he supplied athletes abroad, and he explained that if I wanted anything, then all I had to do was to phone him with an order. He would take the payment by Visa card and send the order to me. Now, buying anabolics wasn't illegal, back then in French pharmacies, but getting them sent into the UK was. But he explained how he simply put beauty product on the customs label. 
and he'd never had a parcel stopped. And he said if he did, it would have got returned to him and he'd simply send another one out to me. Now I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was going, was I going to have my very own pharmacist supply me with all top grade pharmaceutical quality products made by any company in the world that he could get hold of and to be able to order them by telephone <laughs> remember no mobile mobile phones back then it was all landlines i asked him about growth hormone as i'd heard it mentioned by some of the top guys as an almost miracle drug well the name sounds like it doesn't it growth hormone it sounds like it will make you grow he said yes he could order it in and it would just take a day to arrive from his wholesalers he also mentioned if i was inter interested in epo now i'd never heard of that but he explained that bodybuilders had just started using the drug which up to a couple of years before had only been sold to cyclists and runners he explained that it stimulated the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells which made it easier to transfer oxygen around the body and because it made your blood thicker the athlete could perform over long distances better due to the highly oxygenated blood but that bodybuilders were using it pre-contest as a means of increasing vascularity on stage I was obviously going to have to do a lot of homework on pharmacology as no one at that time knew that much about the way the drugs worked only that they did anyway I left him with a large order of various testosterones anabolics and injectable amino acids that I wanted and said I would pick them up the next day as it, it there was more than he had in stock so he would have to order some in for tomorrow i asked about the pricing and the prices were all marked on the boxes literally printed on the boxes so there was obviously nothing dodgy going on it was just another business sale for him with the potential of another mail order customer the products weren't really cheap like the sustenon i was getting from Karachi which was literally just one pound per ampule per box but they were names that I'd never heard of in the UK and since they were standard market prices from a pharmacy I assumed they must be cheaper than what I could have got them for at home even if I'd had been able to get them at home which as it turned out some of them were very very hard to get hold of so after an excited night's sleep, I arrived back at the pharmacy after midday, as the pharmacy had asked. And although a small part of me was thinking, is there gonna be a police van waiting there for me when I walk in? The shop was empty again, apart from the pharmacist who went to his storeroom and he came out with a large plastic bag the size of a dustbin liner full of everything that i'd ordered my eyes nearly popped out of my head <laughs> when i looked inside look there's something about genuine pharmaceutical anabolics that just makes a bodybuilder feel pretty excited because <laughs> you know you're getting the real thing you know it's been made in a sterile and a proper pharmaceutical factory and lastly there were sorts of things in there that i'd never even heard of there were boxes of something called andriol and these were tubs containing little egg-shaped capsules containing 40 milligrams of testosterone undecanoate now they were new to me there were boxes of testosterone heptylate I'd never heard of that either as it would turn out heptilate would be my number one preferred option when it came to testosterone it was literally like rocket fuel and someone else extremely well known in the bodybuilding world back then 
someone that I would be soon training with would also love testosterone heptolate as well as it turned out there were the normal boxes of decagerabalin testosterone propionate testosterone enanthate prima bolin depot but the prima bolin depot wasn't there in single ampules these were ready-made pre-packed syringes already filled with 100 milligrams of primo the only downside to these was that the needles looked absolutely massive they looked like they were to go into a horse or something i, I remember taking my first shot of one of these pre-packed primos thinking this is going to go through the bone or go right through me but it didn't they just looked much bigger than they actually were and there were lots of these single white boxes with a couple of blue squiggly lines on the front the infamous parabolon now i had heard about parabolon and with awe as people were talking about it as though it was extremely strong and had the potential for great gains but it was very difficult to get here they were but they only had 76 milligrams of the active ingredient a trembolone hexa something or other well i'd soon find out that those 76 milligrams taken twice a week were stronger than any amount of testosterone i could take it really was phenomenal and just to relate the product to modern times it was nothing like trembolone acetate or trembolone enanthate that you see on the market today there was none of that horrible trend taste or cough nor the common psychological markers of high aggression that you get with the modern variants now i paid by visa i took his name number and business card and i said i'd probably be back again before i left for home and he said just let me have 40 hours notice so I can make sure I get everything in stock. Now he was a really lovely guy and not just interesting to talk to, but he really gave me an education in anabolics for dummies right there. I think I'd learned more in those two days than I had in my entire life up to that point. Well, I think I'll leave you with that at this point for the first part of the series of posts about my bodybuilding career and anabolic steroids in part two we shall find out whether or not i managed to get home with a suitcase full of anabolics and whether this contact would indeed send more through to me in the future for that and for the next stage of my bodybuilding journey with anabolics please look out for part two of bodybuilder of Paul Baxendale my bodybuilding life and talking about the dark side of our sport anabolic steroids thank you for listening and for watching I'll see you again very shortly and trust me I will go on to discuss everything that I did back in the day and those those days of taking anabolics and talking about anabolics around the table in Temple Gym 2 so goodbye for now, take care, see you very soon.